Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bob Eberling. I am your host today on A Different Perspective. My guest on today's program is Charlie Thompson. Charlie is the Bay Area's baseball extraordinaire. Not only does he possess a brilliant perspective and powerful insight for the game of baseball, he is also a collector of baseball memorabilia and has a head full of baseball statistics and anecdotes. When it comes to baseball, Charlie most assuredly knows his business. Hello, Charlie. Welcome to A Different Perspective. Bob, thanks for having me on today. It's oh, great it's to be here. My pleasure, Charlie. Uh, Charlie, tell us a little about yourself and how you became so involved with baseball and your love for the game. Well, it was my dad who instilled the original seed that made me into what I consider to be. A, I'm a baseball etologist. Baseball is my religion. I don't have access to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, but I can talk to, or it's possible for me to talk to Dusty Baker, Gil Heredia, Shooty Babbitt, Bob Welch, John, Johnny Babbage. These guys are, have uh, given me clues on how to be a better human being, and that's one of the reasons why I love baseball. Not so much the trivia and all. The game is beautiful. To actually watch the game itself is a, a wonderful thing, but accompanying that viewing are the stories and the people around baseball, and that's why I love the game so much. Tell us a little about the days when you were a columnist for the Alameda Sun and were covering the Oakland A's games. There was some work involved. Writing about baseball isn't like going to the beach. It's not pure fun. You do have to do a little work and actually you have to do a lot of work. It is fun to interview the players, but you have to pay your dues after you do that interview. You have to transcribe the tapes to get the accurate story that the players are telling you. And then you have to sit in front of the keyboard and, and to use the words of uh, the, the uh, great uh, baseball writer who escapes my name right now, but he said you stare at the uh, keyboard until blood forms on your forehead, and that's how you write a baseball article. Oh my goodness. Did you, uh, did you like journalism, or did you enjoy the job? Loved it. Loved did it you? very much, uh -huh. yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, what were some of the other media outlets that you were associated with, Charlie? Uh, the first one would be the San Jose Independent Weekly while I was in college. Then uh, the radio stations KXBX, KWTR, KWNE, KAFE, uh, worked with Watts, Steve Watts Radio. And then in uh, the publications would be Sonoma Style Magazine, Santa Rosa Sun, the Santa Rosa News Herald, up until the uh, I got to work with uh, the Alameda Sun. How long were you with the Alameda Sun, Charlie? From 2004 to 2011, uh, fantastic years, and those were some of the years where some of the more interesting characters passed through the Oakland A's uh, clubhouse, guys like Nick Swisher, uh, Rich Harden, mm -hmm. uh, Bobby Kilty, uh -huh. Frank Thomas, great guys, one and all, and fascinating people to uh, get to know. Yeah, I imagine so. Uh, not only are you a sports writer, but you also do photography. Can you tell us a little about your work in that area, Charlie? Photography for a baseball game is probably the easiest to do of the major sports as opposed to basketball and football. You got all this action going on. You don't know where to focus. Mm. And you may think you have a great shot, but the referee's rear end gets in your shot <laughs> when you go back to, uh, to edit it or to look at it. And yeah. you can't have that. No. So in the baseball players, chances are the batter's standing out there by himself or the fielder's going to catch the ball by himself right. with no one around him. And sometimes, you know, there, there may be somebody uh, getting in the shot too, but more often than not, that's going to make the shot better than to detract from it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, you know, I got hooked on wanting to be a baseball card uh, photographer, seeing the great top baseball cards. And I got to meet uh, the Doug McWilliams, the, the guy who shoots uh, baseball cards, or used to for Topps uh, Bubblegum. No kidding. And he's been a great friend. Mm -hmm. And I've learned a lot from him about photography. And I've learned a lot from uh, Michael Zagaris, the uh, A's team photographer, 
uh, you, when you go to baseball games, you have access to that ki kind of talent, and you can ask them questions if, uh, if the opportunity arises. Right. And then seeing the great Sports Illustrated photographers, those guys uh, really sucked me into wanting to be a photographer and to shoot baseball. Mm -hmm. I've heard you say that baseball has made you a better man. You've told me that several times. Can you give us how? How, how has it done that for you? Well, you, you just get around these amazing people who are the best in their field. They're the craftsmen who have applied their art to what they want to do, to their vocation. and. So you, ch you pick and choose the guys who have something really good to say. And it's not to say that other vocations don't have people who are worthy to make you a better human being, but it just seems like there's a concentration of guys in baseball, such as Dusty Baker. You, you get little clues, like how you, you watch how he treats other people, and he makes people feel really good about themselves. Gil Heredia. Mm -hmm. You can watch Gil Heredia talking to somebody, and you'll think, they're lo lifelong friends, and then you find out later this is the first conversation Gil Heredia has had with that person. Okay, you're uh, facing uh, this guy, stud hitter Charlie Thompson today. How are you going to pitch him? Well, uh, as uh, Scott Report says, I think he's got a week down and away, so I'm thinking of throwing a little cutter. Um, I don't know if that stud muffin Charlie Thompson wants to face uh, Dave Stewart. I don't know. But uh, in my books, I think he's an out. I mean, he's basically an easy out. If you throw strikes out, he'll get himself out. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, sir. You're welcome. These guys are uh, amazing in how they interact with people, and they're, mo they're models for me. Um, are you a spectator or a participant in baseball, Charlie, or both? Have you played baseball? You, I mean, I know what a big fan you are, but have you actually gone out there and played the game? I've. My first year in Little League was when I was eight years old, but my dad started pitching to me when I was about three in our backyard. And I just played in a game recently, the San Rosa High School alumni game. Played five innings of left field, had two at bats, grounded out to the shortstop twice. But uh, hey, I can, I'm 52 years old, I can still hit uh, high school pitching. And yeah, so I, I did that uh, just last month. So I'm still playing, and if a game comes up, I'm there mm -hmm. if I have the chance to play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you basically pitch? Is that what you're? No, I can't pitch anymore. Oh. I I uh, have been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, oh. so it doesn't allow me to throw the baseball with the accuracy that I would like. If I tried to throw 20 pitches, maybe one would be a strike. So I ad adapt. I play left field or first base. And that allows me to uh, participate with my uh, my Parkinson's. You mentioned in some of your notes that you learned how to communicate through baseball. How did baseball become a communication tool for you? By seeing how it benefits the whole situation of being around a game, you have to communicate with your teammates. So uh, that's one of the things I've learned from baseball. Mm -hmm. And that, but it's also something I've learned from musicians, and I love music too. I have the music archive, I have the baseball archive, and the reason I have those archives, it's, it's a celebration of people who really do well in their field, musicians and baseball guys, and, then they, and they, that appeals to me. Tell us um, some of your favorite baseball memories. An oldest baseball memory that really sticks with me in, in a sentimental way is when I got to meet Chick Autry. Chick Autry lived across the street from my aunt, and he played in the National League from 1907 to 1909 for the Reds and the uh, Boston organization in the National League. Mm -hmm. He taught me how to play first base. Uh, I didn't know who this old man. Well, I, I knew. I not. To, uh, let me start again. He, he he lived across the street, and I just thought he was some skinny guy who just sat in his chair and watched the traffic roll, roll by until uh -huh. he was at a party at my aunt's house one time and he started telling me the key to a good baseball team was to have a good catcher, a good second baseman, shortstop, and center field. In other words, you had to be strong defensively up the middle. Well, how does this guy know? 
Oh, he played baseball. He played Major League Baseball. Now he had my attention. Now we started asking him questions. I got to mow his lawn. He'd give me a dollar. But something that was far more valuable than the dollar he gave me was all the stories that he told me. Stories about Christy Mathewson, Walter Johnson, the guys who belong on the Mount Rushmore of baseball. And I'm forever thankful and grateful for that, uh, having having that opportunity to meet Chicky Boy, as we call them. Wow, wow. That's, yeah. that's pretty impressive. Now, how about uh, John Babbage? You, you knew him too? He played for Brooklyn in the 30s and the Philadelphia Athletics in the 40s, and he had a stint with Boston in the National League, like Chick did, uh, around 1936. He lived in Richmond. I would go down and see him, oh, every six to eight weeks. And sometimes we talk about baseball. Sometimes we talk about his garden or beef jerky or his dog and never get around to talking about baseball. But he's another guy who helped me make, helped me become a, like a better person because he had high standards for behavior and how you treat other people. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the blessings of my life to have been able to uh, know Johnny so well. Uh, can you give any examples of uh, why Casey Stengel was such a great uh, baseball mind? Oh, I don't know. He just knew baseball. He really knew baseball, that guy. Uh -huh. In yeah, what way? Every way. I mean, I can remember a time we was, we was playing in Chicago. Yeah, the National League was playing the Cubs. And we stayed at this big hotel on the on the Bay Shore in Chicago. I wish I could think of the name of it. And we had a few rookies on the club. So he'd be down there in the hotel and we'd talking with us. And he'd say, any of you guys know how to slide? I said, well, I never had much chance to do any sliding. He says, I'm going to show you how. Had garboons, you know, all over. No, that was in '34. That's been a long time. Everybody was chewing tobacco and spitting in those things. He took a garboon and set it right out in the middle of the floor, and he says, "This is the way to hook slide." And he showed, with his suit on, he slid all over those rugs. He says, "Now you guys do it, and then I'll tell you whether you're doing it right or not." Were you guys in your suits too? Sure, oh, heck yeah. That's the way he was. It didn't matter. He just he had he could he could have a baseball lesson in a hotel. Oh right, I'm telling you, boy, he could show you how to play ball right there. What about Eddie Juiced? Uh, you knew him too. Not as well as Mr. Babbage, but the m one uh, interesting note about John and uh, Eddie, they were a couple of the last living members of the San Francisco Missions. Everybody. Well, not, um, a lot of baseball fans are aware that before the Giants moved to San Francisco, there were the San Francisco Seals, a Pacific Coast League team. Well, that was a long time ago, wasn't Up it? Up until 1957. Then in huh. 1958, the Giants moved to San Francisco. Yeah. Eddie and Johnny played for the other Pacific Coast League team that was only around in the 30s, the San Francisco Missions, or the San Francisco Mission Reds, or the, the Reds. So they, I believe they moved to Hollywood in uh, 1937, somewhere around there. And there's not that many left to, to this day, but having the opportunity to meet Eddie and uh, Johnny and have them talk about what it was like to pl play for the missions, it's invaluable, priceless, you know. Now, you also are familiar with Shooty Babbitt? Met him in the press box at the Oakland Coliseum when I was covering the A's. He was a scout at the time, I believe, for the Diamondbacks. Now I believe he's a scout for the Mets. But he's also the kangaroo court judge at the A's fantasy camps that are held in January down in Phoenix, and which is unbelievable time you, when you go to that camp you're that you're treated like a major league player you use major league facilities you oh. have the major league trainers I wish every fan could do it because you you just you make friends that you'll have for the rest of your life oh now what's involved in going to a camp like that Charlie do you just you, you play a lot of baseball uh -huh. you hear a lot of stories from the former players who are the coaches such as Campy Campaneris 
Bob Welch, or uh, Bob Welch did it a couple times, but uh, Mike Moore, Dave Henderson. Wow. And uh, Shooty is the kangaroo court judge. If somebody walks around with the wrong color shoes or has their pocket hanging out or, or ignores uh, instruction or direction from the coach, you can be brought up in court on charges. And Shooty is the judge, and he works that room like a stand-up comedian from the cat skills. He's funny, he's creative, he's quick. But my favorite story about Shooty uh -huh. happened when my sister was being taken back by me and my parents to the airport. Her family came out, and we're, I, I got them to uh, the airport. And coming out of the airport, my mom's a little sad, as she always is, because her daughter's going back east. Mm -hmm. Here comes Shooty across the street to go on a trip. And, oh, Mom, Dad, look, there's Shooty Babbitt. Let's, let's uh, say hi to him. And Shooty, I'm pretty sure, could tell that my mom was a little upset. So he puts his arm around her, they have a nice conversation. He made my mom feel really good, and that's all she could talk about on her hour-long trip back to Santa Rosa was about Shooty Babbitt. So every time she knows that I'm gonna be in Shooty's company, she makes me deliver a bag of her cookies to him, which, and they're the best cookies in the world. And I think there's a photo up here of uh, the Shooty, Gil Heredia and Greg Cattery eat my mom's cookies in the dugout in, at fantasy camp. So I, I can't say enough good things about Shooty Babbitt. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great memory, Charlie. What about Greg Goderet? What do you know Cattery, about him? Greg Cad Cattery. I've been on his team twice, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, so you're, you may face that slugger, Charlie Thompson. How are you going to pitch to him? I don't have to change speeds to keep the ball away. If you leave something in his wheelhouse, he can really hurt you. Swear to God. Swear to God. You know where we send the liars. <laughs> I wouldn't lie about Charlie. Okay, thank you. He's a, a great guy. He's a great father, a great family man, and another one of those people who's like a model for me. How about Dusty Baker? What do you know about him? Dusty. Everybody wants to play for Dusty. It's a shame the Giants couldn't have kept him because it's like having a coupon. You could get a lot of players for less money who would rather play for, for Dusty than to make more money for another team. And now the Cincinnati Reds are the beneficiaries of his uh, services. But he's, he's the one who taught me you have to do extra work. Um, you know, not only have I learned how it's great to treat people the way Dusty does, but there was a game being played at Candlestick, and while the game was going on, he went into the back batting cage and worked on his swing to prepare in case he had to pinch hit. And he allowed me to take photos of him hitting balls on the, off the batting tee. And he was disgusted with his team in 1985, I think it was, because they didn't do the extra work like they were supposed to, like a good major leaguer would do. So from Dusty, I learned you got to do the extra work. You just don't come out and play the game. And I was able to pass this on and show these photos to my little leaguer teams. And it's made a difference for them. They, a lot of kids picked up the uh, message that you got to do the extra work. Now what about Bob Welch? What do you know about? Bob Welch is incredible. I met him at a golf tournament. And we had a lot of fun that day. And We've stayed in touch. I've uh, I've just become a big Bob Welch fan since I met him, and I'm very thankful that I met him. But he's he's a great guy. I, uh, he'll call me up out of the blue every now and then, and uh, we'll have a wonderful chat. Or I'll see him. I'll just run into him at an A's game, and then the day gets better because Bob Welch is in my day for that moment. Is there anybody else that you... Uh... Campy Campaneris is a great guy. Tell us a little about him. He's from Cuba, one of the last guys to come out of uh, the Cuban uh, islands before uh, Castro turned off the spigot for many years. And now, now there's a, a, a slight pipeline of players coming from Cuba. Cespedes, Jonas Cespedes is uh, a Cuban playing for the Oakland A's. But Campy, I met originally at the uh, Ace Fantasy Camp. He was on the world championship team. He came, o came over with the A's from Kansas City when they moved from Kansas City 
He's the first guy to play all nine positions in one game. And at the A's camp, the first one I ever went to, before we started playing that first day, he started telling me about his first game where he got an at bat. And the first pitch he ever saw, he hit a home run off of Jim Cott, hit another home run in that game. And I remember thinking, my God, this is a great way to spend your life, to just play baseball and hear these great stories from guys you uh, looked up to when you were a kid. And uh, at the end of the camp, Campy had to leave a couple days early to take care of another uh, appointment. And as he's going out the door, I said to him, Campy, you know, this isn't just the highlight of my day. This is the highlight of my year to be able to meet you and be in your presence. And he, he was humbled and he thanked me. And he went away. And then about five minutes later, he came up to me and he said, Charlie, I'm leaving now. Is there anything else you want me to sign before I go out the door? I've never had um, uh, somebody offer to autograph something for me without me having to ask them. And for Campy to do that, that was something that made a big impression on me. And then there's the guys in, in my uh, everyday life who've been fantastic baseball buddies like Bob Borges who helps me do workouts when I'm preparing for the game. Or we talk about baseball or we go to a lot of baseball games together. And I've been aware of Bob Borges ever since he stole a double from me. I was, I, he was playing first base and I was about nine years old. I hit this screaming line drive. so. I hit the ball so hard, the ball said, ouch, right after I hit it. <laughs> and it's, it's extra bases down the right field line, maybe even an inside the park home run. Huh. Bob Borges reaches up, steals this ball out of the air, got me out, and there went my base hit, there went my extra bases. And for uh, a short time, I hated Bob Borges, despised him for stealing that. But we've become very good friends. He and I drove to Utah one time to see Gil Heredia coaching in action. Gil's now the uh, pitching coach for Visalia, but last, last year he was in Missoula, Montana. And when Missoula came to Utah, Bob and I drove, because we like to do the road trips to baseball uh, events. And uh, that was one of the better ones, getting to see Gil in Utah. But Bob, Bob has helped me out a lot. Uh, Scott Wagner, He's a great, good friend, mm -hmm. and a, my buddy, the Rat Man, Nick Rathosis, has a shrine to baseball at his house in, in the uh, New England area. Uh, Tom Unthank is a great friend of mine. He's uh, a big A's fan, and we, we compare A's notes all the time. There's uh, Mike Markey, great baseball fan, great friend, and uh, we love to talk about the A's. There's uh, my, my son, Andrew, is a big Giants fan, and to a lesser degree, an A's fan. And then Hannah, my daughter, she's a baseball fan, too. And, I've, and my kids love to go to uh, baseball games with me. Uh, I'm very thankful for my friends who uh, really love baseball. Mm -hmm. Well, that's wonderful that your, your children want to go with you to these games. I mean, what a great family outing that is. Oh, man, yeah. Ever since my son was... Uh, an infant, I, I was taking him to games. And mm. the first game, it was just me and him. We sat by the Giants bullpen and I had Andrew, uh, I, I asked Rod Beck and a few other players if they'd be interested in holding my son for pictures and they, they accommodated me. And then when we were finished taking pictures, they would voluntarily ask me, hey, here's, here's a ball for your son, would you like one? So. I didn't have to ask them for a ball, they just gave my son baseballs, and that's like getting a pearl, you know? Really? It's like getting a jewel. It's, yeah. a, it's a wondrous thing. Yeah. And what about Dave Henderson, your association with him? Dave is the player, former player, who uh, has his name on the fantasy camp. It's called Dave Henderson's Baseball Adventures. He's number 42. You'll see behind you a number 42 to honor Jackie Robinson. Dave Henderson was number 42 because Jackie Robinson meant so much to him. He's a funny guy and a good baseball player and a mm -hmm. good good person who cares about people. And 
it's one, another one of the blessings of my life to have met Dave Henderson. Really, Charlie, it's certainly been a pleasure having you here today, and uh, thank you so much for being a guest on A Different Perspective. Thank you for allowing me to share my love for baseball with everybody. I really appreciate that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching A Different Perspective.